And there's been a lot of recent excitement about deep learning networks, which are inspired by the hierarchical processing in the visual system of the brain, and which can be trained to recognize patterns like human faces or cats in YouTube videos. This combination of fast hardware and improved algorithms has now allowed computers to outperform brains on a range of different tasks, for example, playing chess or playing video games. And computers can now challenge the performance of humans for sophisticated tasks like object recognition, one of the holy grails of computer vision. However, brains are still better than computers at many tasks, particularly those that involve interacting with the real world. You know, we have Lionel Messi scoring a beautiful goal, and for comparison, here we have the current state of the art of <laughs> robot soccer. This is taken from the 2015 Robot Soccer World Cup. The key question now is, what is the origin of the superior performance of the human brain? First of all, neurons are remarkable computing devices. Each neuron gets up to 10,000 synaptic inputs, each of which is plastic and allows neurons and brains to store huge amounts of information, much more efficiently than computers can. Brains run at only about 12 watts of power, orders of magnitude more efficient than the computer. But neurons cannot just store information, but they also can, also can process information. So in my lab, we're using lasers to activate individual synaptic inputs in patterns to single dendrites. And with these experiments, we can show that single neurons can already solve computational tasks like pattern recognition. If neurons are so smart, why is it so hard to understand how the brain works? Well, there's two main problems. The first is that neurons are embedded in neural circuits, which are very complicated. This is an image of a neural circuit taken from the so-called brainbow mouse developed by Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sains at Harvard. And you can see from this image that reconstructing the wiring diagram of such a circuit, even when all the neurons are labeled with different colors, is a great challenge. The second problem is that we don't know the neural code. To study pain, we need this um, laser device. Because that is a way of giving uh, a pure pain sensation without any touch, because the laser hits the skin and activates some pain-specific nerve fibers that tells the brain that that hitting has happened and that results in a sensation of pain. Uh, we need to measure this pain in some way, for example, by asking, uh, using some scales to rate the intensity of pain perceived. And then we also want to uh, measure the brain activity to understand how the brain reacts to this um, painful stimuli. And that we can do, for example, by placing electrodes on the head of the subject and recording the so-called electroencephalogram, which is basically, as we can see here, a plot of the electrical activity of the neurons uh, composing uh, the brain. So basically, um, what we found out, and we can try to do that live now, um, when we deliver a, a laser uh, pure pain without any touch to the hand of our subject, we can see the brain reaction. For example, we give a stimulus now, and if we look at the um, activity here, we can see that when the stimulus is delivered, which is this blue line, there is a small response in the uh, ongoing activity of the brain. And then if we deliver the same stimulus, but when the hands are crossed over the midline, like in this case, um, we can uh, again deliver a stimulus and record the activity in the uh, electroencephalogram. And we can see, again here, there is the stimulus and there is the small deflection, which is basically the uh, brain reaction to the external uh, painful stimulus. Basically, we need very sophisticated algorithms. And we actually need machines to help us build those sophisticated algorithms. The one that is very popular today is deep learning. Many of you probably have heard of it. This is what Google is going into. It's what Microsoft, Facebook. What you're really seeing is the brain carrying out algorithms, but they're very, very sophisticated algorithms that you have to 
uh, and, and as you learn, you adjust your communication between your different nodes so that you can actually execute that algorithm better and better and faster and faster. This is just an example of uh, the kind of circuitry that you get in a, such a tiny piece. Now, again, it's about the size of a pinhead. You have about 7 million connections, 40 million synapses that are connecting them together. And we're starting to get a good idea of the blueprint circuits. And these circuits could be printed into silicon chips and then run, mimicking closely how the, bre the algorithm that has come out of evolution. You can, of course, take that further. And this is a simulation of a region of the brain that is where you have now about 5 million cells, and they're interacting together, executing the algorithm. Now, of course, you can see that this is very different from what you would look at if you looked at a computer processor and how they are transmitting information. This is an example of a robot in the Human Brain Project. One of the things that we're doing, the European Human Brain Project, is that for many years, uh, researchers at the Technical University in Munich have been evolving physical robots. And this is one of the most advanced, latest robots called Roboy. And he's actually a showcase. He goes around to stages and to schools and, and, and he can in, people can interact with them and talk and question. And there's a lot of intelligence that's gone into this. But now what we will try and do is to see how we can add intelligence to that by using these brain-derived circuits that closely mimic how the brain functions. So basically, why would you want to go from these fantastic chips that we use today, which are fast and highly reliable, to a brain-like circuit, which is somewhat much slower in some sense, they communicate in the range of hertz and not gigahertz, and very messy, appearing very messy. Well, there are many different reasons, which you can see here. It's adaptive, it's iterative, it's self-learning. You can throw it into an environment and the algorithm will find its way until it can learn. It's contextual, which means you change, switch off the light and it will adapt so that the algorithm can still operate. And it can become very personalized. It can be adapted to you. The Bohan uh, group has built an amazing uh, neuromorphic chip where they basically have only neurons <coughs> sitting on the chip. They can build this into a board. They can build a million neurons into it. It's about 100,000 times more energy efficient than any chip out there.